funky number. We're going to get you off of your sofa and dancing, hopefully. Praise in the hands in the air. Praise hands. Uh, this is a song my dad wrote when I was about two years old, and he's done it all over different church camps and uh, concerts. Do concerts and churches, and it's always a huge hit. It's called Got No Blues.
color Flashes of lightning Rolls of thunder Blessing in honor Strength and glory Thou will be To you the only wise king yeah. And holy, holy, holy Is the Lord God Almighty Who was in this
Hi, this is Pastor Leonard and Pauline here. Hi. From, uh, from a home in Diamond Bar, California. We welcome you to the Journey Church worship. And as we always do, we begin worship uh, with a pledge to the Word of God. So let's pledge. Let's take your Bible and you take your electronic device or whatever you have and just, uh, just make this pledge together. This is my Bible. I am what it says that I am. I have what it says that I have, and I can do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught the Word of God. It is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It reveals the thoughts and attitude deep within my heart. I boldly confess that my mind's alert, my, mind, my heart is receptive, and after that, hearing these words, I will be a doer of the Word of God, not a hearer only. Speak to me, O Lord. Your servant is listening. Well, good morning, YouTube worshipers. We're so happy to have you join us here. I'm excited to tell you this morning that we're introducing a new series of messages uh, for the summer months of 2020. We're going to open our Bibles into the New Testament and we're going to uh, preach 13 messages uh, out of the book of James. Uh, the book of James is one of the most helpful, practical books in all of the Bible. Uh, it's a, a book that you might say is all about spiritual maturity 101. It's a book designed to promote uh, growing up in Christ with the point and the purpose uh, to reach that point in our place of our life that we have a mature faith. And uh, I'm happy you're going to be doing that and being a part of of it. When you look at the book of James as we are this morning, there's some things about it that uh, give you some uh, understanding as you look at the background. And so today's message is really going to be an introduction to these five chapters of the book of James. If you look there in chapter 1 and verse 1, you see James doesn't waste any time getting into his subject. He says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Now, James, the author, uh, most historians who really have studied uh, history and the background of the New Testament agree that this James is actually the physical brother of Jesus. We know that Jesus had family, brothers and sisters. It doesn't appear that any of them uh, had put their faith in him until the cross and the resurrection but uh, James uh, became to be an early leader in the church. In fact, it's believed that he uh, was the pastor of that church in Jerusalem that would send out so many believers all across the Mediterranean world. And so he writes this letter uh, to Jewish Christians, but he says to the 12 tribes that are scattered. So this letter got circulated uh, as far as it could go to wherever there were uh, pockets of believers that had come together. Now, the background of what's going on uh, in the book of James, we might say that in early Christianity, uh, there was this excitement and this enthusiasm after Jesus' resurrection. We see the things that happen in the book of Acts, the first eight chapters, but then we see persecution uh, break out, and they become to be scattered across those parts of the world. And I think maybe the best way to describe what's going on there in the book of James is the honeymoon is over. Um, all the early enthusiasm and excitement uh, that had happened had had time to wear off. They had come back to the real world and it didn't mean that they were any less committed to Jesus, but it just became to be for them as it is for you and me uh, an acute awareness that we live in a broken down world, that we have a spiritual enemy, that there are demonic forces that are warring against the church and God's people all the time. I know what that feels like, and I know that you do also. But this was early on in Christianity. They had this mistaken belief that when the angel said as Jesus went back to heaven, the same way you saw him go up, you'll see him come back. They understood that they thought for them that it meant in their lifetime 
And so there evidently were some of the believers that were losing heart because Jesus hadn't come. But most of all, it was just the crushing world that most of them existed in, a world of, of uh, meager means, uh, a world for many of them of, of very difficult kind of lives, and for a sizable number of the uh, folks who would come to know Christ through the years uh, in those early days, it would mean trying to live out their faith as slaves. In the Roman world, uh, slavery was the backbone of its economy. Uh, in fact, there were estimated to be as many as 60 million slaves who lived in the uh, Roman world. Uh, and they had no hope for most of them that it ever was going to end. Uh, they were uh, in a life that put them on the bottom rung of the ladder, if you will, uh, economically in the Roman world. But most of us would agree the bottom rung of the ladder is preferable to being at the bottom of the barrel. But the bottom of the barrel is evidently where Christian slaves ended up. They were a very discriminated against group of folks. They uh, were the scourge of society and culture. Uh, they were universally uh, disliked and, and in fact um, were hated and, and often uh, were the subject of tremendous cruel persecutions uh, by a number of emperors uh, all the way up to the fourth century. And so all of that is going on and all of that uh, is being dealt with. They were accused of terrible things. Uh, they were accused of cannibalism. You say, well, how in the world could anybody accuse Christians of cannibalism? It was because they took the Lord's Supper and they talked metaphorically that this is uh, Jesus' body and this is his blood. But the outside world, uh, the pagan world, the world that didn't have any spiritual connection to Jesus, they just said, well, they're just a bunch of cannibals. Uh, they were accused of gross immorality because they were always talking about loving one another. And they talked about loving your brother and loving your sister and loving your father and loving your mother and loving your neighbor. And in that sin-soaked world of sexuality and sensuality of that day, they just assumed uh, the worst, that those were all uh, immoral practices that uh, they did when they came together. Uh, most dangerously, they were accused of subversion to the Roman government because they refused to say that Caesar is Lord. They refused to acknowledge that Caesar was God. They said, we only have one God. We only have one master, and his name is Jesus. And as a result, a terrible persecution was breaking out. And so when James writes this letter, he tries to give them an antidote to living in a broken down world. His uh, whole point of the letter is how to be a, a positive person in a negative world. And we need that as much today as they needed it in the first century when James uh, wrote these words. So the book of James is really about attitude. It's a really about growing up in the Lord, uh, developing spiritual maturity. It's about coming to a point to have real uh, mature faith. In fact, if you look there with me in chapter 1 at verse 4, the whole heart of this uh, book, these five chapters, is really described in verse 4. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now there are three words in the Greek language that give this a lot of punch. One is the word teleos. Uh, it means something that's perfected. It means something that is complete. It means something that has completed its course. Uh, there's also these two words in the Greek language that come together, uh, halokaros, uh, and together they mean something that is mature in every way it can be. There is no area where growth is needed. And then there is a final word they've called uh, lepestos, uh, which means to be deficient in nothing. And when you put those three together, you get that comment here that James says of what mature faith looks about, that it's mature and complete, 
and it's not lacking anything. I want to just talk about mature faith in a moment, but let's pray right now uh, as we get ready to do that. Father, we thank you that we are today beginning this new series of messages from the book of James. Father, I know that it's important that we hear these words about maturing in our faith, uh, that we hear it individually, and that we hear it collectively as a congregation. And our desire here at The Journey and all of our YouTube family members who are out there is that we are all growing individually and we are growing collectively to be mature uh, and complete followers of Christ. And so God, as we complete this brief overview of this uh, book right now, I pray you'd help us to be honest and transparent about what's going on in our walk, in our journey of faith uh, this morning. So what I want to do in the last few minutes of this message is I want to ask you to take a test with me. Would you be willing to do that? It's not a test that's very hard. It's not a test that you really are going to be graded on in such a way that anybody's going to see your score. This is just a, a test between you and the Lord. But the test I want to ask you to take this morning is a test based on what James says in this letter are the five qualities of mature faith. And so I'm going to ask you five questions, and I want to ask you to look with some verses with me in each of the five chapters, and it won't take us long to do that, and you have an opportunity to make a decision uh, about where you are, and if you really need this study and this book, and I think probably most of us are going to say yes, because I don't know that any of us are going to grade out uh, completely off the charts, no room for growth. I know I have room as I wrote this message uh, for more maturity in my life, and I'm going to guess that you might as well. The first thing that uh, James says is a test uh, is found there in the verses we read in verse 2, 3, and 4, and that is, are you a positive person uh, when you are under pressure? Because the real uh, test of our faith is not our circumstances, but our response to our circumstances. It's not really about our aptitude uh, as much as it is our attitude that we have. And as we live in a broken down world, there are times when life becomes really, really stressful. Um, and in fact, um, James would say uh, it's one of the greatest ways to determine uh, how much spiritual maturity has been able to be developed in your life. Because here's the goal that he says, beginning in verse 2. Uh, and some of us, he loses us right at the beginning because he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, I don't know about you, but joy probably is not the first thought, the first emotion, the reaction uh, that I've had in my life if I face trials. But what James is asking us to do is look at the big picture here. And he says, you can't go from A to B, you can't go from B to C, you can't go from the beginning of spiritual development to the end of real spiritual maturity without trials, because trials are how we grow. Uh, you know, we talk about when we're lifting weights, no pain and no gain. And it's really true spiritually that unless we have trials that cause us to depend upon our faith, to deepen our trust in Jesus, to develop some patience to wait and let the Holy Spirit work instead of us going in and trying to either uh, inoculate ourselves uh, from the pain of our trials or to cause us to just run and find some quick fix that sometimes makes our situations worse. He says, consider it joy, because when this is over, the result of it is that, look at that, because in verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith will develop perseverance. Every time we go through a trial, James says, every time we go through a, a new test, uh, we get a little more patient. We get a little more trusting. Honestly, we get a little less afraid. Uh, we find out that we can do more than we thought we can do. We find out 
that we can trust God in this new trial because we can look back and see how God came through for us in a, a previous trial. Maybe this morning, yeah, you're right in the middle of some test, some trial, some great challenge, some uh, exceedingly difficult uh, course of obstacle that seems to be before you right now. Well, God's going to use that. We say at the journey all the time, uh, no trial lasts forever. No storm lasts forever. Always has a beginning and it always has an end. Some of us right now, you're closer for it ending than uh, you might even realize. But the whole point of that is, is the testing of your faith will develop perseverance. And perseverance must, he says in verse 4, it must finish its work so that you can be, what we said a moment ago, a mature, complete, lacking in nothing. You see, God wants to know, will you trust him? Will you walk with him? Will you not lose your composure? Will you not give in to the stress of the temporary difficulty you might be in? I like what somebody said a few years ago when I first heard it or read it, that people are like tea bags. You really don't know what they're made of until they get in some hot water. And you know that's true about our Christian faith. We don't really know how trustworthy God is until he's the only person, the only place that we can put our trust. And so the first question you might ask yourself right now, am I a positive person in times of stress? Do I give in to pressure? Do I lose my patience? Do I uh, lose my faith? Or is the perseverance that is necessary being able to be developed? Now there's a, a second test uh, there in chapter 2. And it is this test right here. Am I sensitive toward others? Let's look at what he says there in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as law breakers. James is really big on fake faith. Uh, James really has a strong dislike for people who cannot uh, walk the talk, if you will. And James says that it doesn't matter uh, what you've accomplished, where you've been, what you've done, how close you say you are to the Lord, how many times you've read the Bible, if you can't pass the test of being empathetic toward other people, you're not mature in your faith. In fact, Paul, you know, in chapter 13, that famous love chapter, says you may be able to sing uh, like the angels. You may be able to preach as powerful as anyone has ever preached. You may be able to give riches away for wonderful causes. But if you don't have love for your fellow man, if you don't have a sensitive heart for other people, then you're failing the test of mature faith. It's really interesting, right at the end of Jesus' life, he talked about the sheep and the goats. He talked about the wheat and the tares. And he said there are going to be people who've always proclaimed that who are his followers that he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. And the only really test, he says, is how you treated others. He said, when I was thirsty, did you give me drink? When I was hungry, did you give me food? When I was in prison, did you come and visit me? And Jesus says the real proof and the real test of our faith is how we treat other people, how we get along with others, uh, how empathetic we might be, how much of an encourager that we are. So let me ask you that second question today. How mature are you in this area of your life of being sensitive to other people? Well, let's look in chapter 3, and let me ask you a third test question. Have you mastered your mouth? Have you tamed your tongue? Wow, is this some powerful, powerful words. Uh, look at what... Uh, James says in chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person 
It sets the whole course of his life on fire, and it itself is set on fire. Watch this. By hell. Verse 7, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Isn't it interesting that when we're sick and we go to the doctor, the first thing he asks us to do is to stick out our tongue? You see, our tongue is not only a barometer of our physical health, but James says, stick out your tongue. Have you mastered your mouth? Have you tamed your tongue? And this is an area for some of us, this is our area where we're really at our weakest. Uh, you know, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, there in verse 29, don't let any words come out of your mouth unless they are helpful words for building other people up as they have need. Paul says our words uh, are one of the most powerful ways that we show the fact that Jesus lives in our hearts. But they're also one of the most contradictory parts of some of us of our testimony and of our faith because we love Jesus uh, and we praise him and we pray to him. But James says uh, there in chapter 5 at one point, he said it's not right that you praise Jesus with your tongue and with that same tongue you curse men. You see, if, I, if our tongue is a discouraging tongue, if our tongue is a, a lying tongue, if our tongue is a slanderous tongue, if our tongue is a discouraging tongue, if our tongue is a gossiping tongue, we fail this test miserably. And James says here, the hardest thing in the world to do in maturing your faith is mastering your mouth. It's, it's taming your tongue. In fact, James says you can't do it on your own. It's just too much wickedness in every one of us. There's too much sin that lives in our heart. And Jesus said, uh, out of the mouth proceeds the things of the heart. Our mouth only uh, reflects what's in our heart, what's in our mind. And James says mature faith has learned to tame that. Mature faith has learned to mature that. And mature faith is a tongue that's been tamed. Mature faith is a, a mouth that's been mastered. And so I ask you this third test. How are you doing? How do you score yourself on that? Let me ask you a fourth question. It's out of chapter 4. And it simply is the question, are you a troublemaker? Or are you a, a peacemaker? Look at what James says in chapter 4, verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and you covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and you fight. Uh, you do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. James says, one of the real marks of a, a mature person is that they're a peacemaker. And one of the real indications that you haven't really reached where God wants you to be if you're more of a troublemaker than a peacemaker. In fact, I would tell you that uh, one of the greatest ways to know how to answer that question is to ask yourself, are you someone who lives a conflict-free life are you someone that seems to always be in conflict with other people? Maybe in your family, maybe at your work, uh, maybe among your friends. The more mature we become, the more of a peacemaker we are. That's one of the Beatitudes that Jesus gave in his Sermon on the Mount. He, he says, blessed are peacemakers. But there's nothing blessed about troublemakers. And some people just go through life and they're, create storms, they cause difficulty, they get people to begin to fight among themselves. That's not the nature of Jesus. That's not the kind of life that he portrayed. It's not the way that he lived his life. Uh, Proverbs 13 sin uh, says that whenever pride shows up, there will always be strife. So when it's always has to be my way, 
when I always have to win, when I always have to put other people down to build myself up. I'm never going to be a peacemaker. I'll always be a troublemaker. And that is a sign of someone who has not matured in their faith in that area of their life. So let me ask you, how'd you do there on number four? And then let me ask you about this final one there in chapter five. It's the question, in stressful times, are you a patient person? And in stressful times, are you a prayerful person? Look at what uh, James says in chapter five, verse seven. He says, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. That means be patient the rest of your life till Jesus comes. He says, look at the example of the farmer. The farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patiently he waits for the autumn rains and the spring rains. Doesn't rain in the summer. Uh, he can't plant in the wintertime. So he knows he has to plant and wait for the early rains and he has to wait for the late rains that come at just the right time. One of the signs of uh, people of mature faith is that even when life isn't going the way they want it to go, even when there isn't going to be an instant or an immediate remedy to their struggles, even when it might be that it's going to be a bit longer before God finally does what you've been praying for him to do, will you patiently wait? Impatient people are not people of mature faith. Impatient people make their situations worse instead of better. They often go out and try to find a quick fix, which is just adds to the pain and the misery and sometimes adds to the time you have to wait. But James says there's something else that indicates how uh, mature we are in our faith when we're having to wait is not only patience, but also prayerfulness. He says in James chapter 5, verse 13, uh, is any of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing a song of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And watch this. And the prayer offered in faith will make a sick person the well because the Lord will raise him up when God's people are that committed to faithful prayer. And when you look at that, you have to ask yourself, you know, is there prayerfulness in who we are? Is there a maturity in my following of Jesus? Do I need a reminder that there's a difference between no and not yet? I remember our boys didn't understand that when they were young. They thought not yet meant no forevermore. Sometimes it just meant it's not the right time. It's not the right place. It's not the best way to do it. But as a, as a dad, I always wanted to bring my kids joy in life and do the things together that they wanted to do. But the timing wasn't always right. And some of us need to be reminded today that the more immature we are, that we sometimes seem to misunderstand that a not yet from God is not necessarily a no from God. And maybe God brought you here in this message today just to hear that if you didn't hear anything else. That a, a, a mature follower of Jesus is a patient follower of Jesus. That a, a mature follower of Jesus is a prayerful person of Jesus. So let me ask you as we come to a close this morning, how'd you do on your test? Uh, you know, maturity is not about age. You can can be a, a very old person and still a very immature person. And it's not about accumulations. Uh, it's not about acquisitions. But uh, mature faith is about attitude. And this is what we want to work on this summer. This is what we want to let God do some surgery on us spiritually over these next 13 weeks. We want to come out of this with people who are positive people in a negative world. And that was the advice that James gave them in the first century. And I'm pretty sure if James were able to be here with us this morning on YouTube, he'd say, you know what, it's as true today as it's ever been before. Many of you know I'm a pretty big sports fan. Um, and uh, through the years, I uh, love to watch the 
PGA golf. And in fact, when we lived in Houston, I used to go out to the Houston Open back in the 80s and I always followed the same golf or every year we would go. My dad would come down and he'd follow Tom Kite, but always followed Greg Norman. Greg Norman in those days was a big hitter off the tee box. Wasn't always very accurate. But he ended up being uh, a tremendous golfer. He had a great career. He's in the top 10 earners ever in the history of the PGA Tour. But um, he did something pretty remarkable back in 2008 in the British Open uh, when he was 53 years old. Uh, after the third round on Saturday, he was leading the tournament. They didn't win it. Patrick Harrington had a, a great uh, fourth round, shot a 69 in some miserable weather coming off the Irish Sea. Winds were blowing over 40 miles an hour. But Greg Norman came in third, and he did it at the age of 53, and no one had ever finished in a major tournament uh, that high uh, at that age. And you say, well, how did he have the fortitude at 53 to be able to play under such difficult conditions, uh, under such pressure like the British Open. Well, you had to go back to what happened to him 12 years earlier. In 1996, he led the Masters through round one, round two, round three. He went in uh, to the fourth round of the Masters. All he had to do was pretty much play par golf. He had an eight stroke lead. And in fact, he played the worst round of golf he ever played. He lost 11 strokes. And impossibly, it seemed, he didn't win that tournament. Nick Faldo came from behind and beat him because he played so terrible. It was the perhaps the, the greatest breakdown crash. Uh, it was excruciating to watch because I still remember watching it. He just, he just melted under the pressure that day. But you know what? That produced fortitude in him. Uh, it produced a perseverance in him. It produced some patience in him. And 12 years later, at the age of 53, he comes back and almost wins the British Open, finishes third, and does something no one in any major championship has ever done before or since, finished that high past the age. 50 years old and to me Greg Norman is a great metaphor for you and me today we haven't always gotten it right and we've sometimes failed the test but all of that is an opportunity to bring it together right now and say I want to finally be a mature man I want to be a mature woman in Jesus to do that I need to make the best of my difficult situations and my tests and my trials and instead of being angry about it or sad about it or fearful about it I want to have spiritual joy about it not because I like it not because this would be my choice but because I know when it's over God's going to do something really really great in my life from it and in the same way that uh, Greg Norman matured as a golfer our trials and our tribulations our failures our flaws our difficulties they can be something God can use right now and I want to ask you to plug in over these next uh, 13 weeks with us here and I want to ask you to let God really speak to your heart uh, and really understand that the book of James is a manual for spiritual maturity and I really pray that you will be here be a part of it and will really let God speak to you and do something wonderful and great in your life in that when this is all over they'll be able to look at you and me and say boy there's a guy there's a gal that can sure pass those five tests they indeed have become to be a mature follower of Christ let's pray together Father we thank you today for the book of James. We thank you for its very practical nature. And we thank you that in it and through it, you're going to speak to us and teach us and show us things about it that we wouldn't know otherwise if it were not for this book. We thank you that you never waste a hurt, that you never waste a pain, that in every situation we go through in this broken down world, 
that it's only temporary, but through that, the Holy Spirit can do something really, really good and use it to mature us in our faith in Jesus. I pray, Father, that we would come out of this and be very positive people in a very negative world. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you next time. Hey guys. Hi Journey family, coming to you from San Pedro, California. Uh, if you'll join us in our benediction, we hope that you enjoyed the message today and that God spoke to you. May the, the kindness, kindness of God, God precede you. you. May the wisdom of God, God guide you. you. May the, the light, light of God direct you. you. And, and may God, God be with us until, until we meet again. again. All right, see you guys, love you. Bye.